Hi, and welcome to the June 2014 edition of the Cycle 360 podcast. The Cycle 360 committee has some great sections to share with you. In this podcast, we'll have a sneak peek at the results of the Cycle Employment Survey that was completed this spring. Joel Corey has a very informative interview with John Patrick, an attorney specializing in contract negotiation, a very important topic when it comes to signing your job contract. Deb French interviews Dr. David Grenache from the University of Utah and ARUP Laboratories as the second of our two-part series on transitioning from your first professional position to another. And finally, last, but certainly not least, Kaylin will have our annual preview of the upcoming AACC meeting. This year, the meeting will be in Chicago. I hope that you can all attend for a meeting packed with innumerable learning opportunities and almost as many opportunities to network with your peers. As I just mentioned, I will be previewing the results of the Cycle Employment Survey that was sent out this spring. But first, I'd like to wish all of those who will be sitting for the ABCC exams in July the best of luck. Study hard. In the spring of 2014, the Cycle Committee sent out an online survey with the goal of providing current trainees and those about to take on their first professional position with some data on what to expect in their first position. There can be a lot of anxiety about making the move from fellowship to a professional position. Questions about when you should start looking for a job to how many positions your peers applied for prior to accepting a position can tax your sanity. There is also the issue of salary. Do you know what your value is? What kind of salary should you expect? It's not a sign of greed to want to know, and you certainly do not want to undervalue your skills or to be underpaid. In order to get accurate information for the survey, we targeted only those cycle members who are board certified via the ABCC, NRCC, and a few others. In addition, the targeted individuals had to have completed their fellowship training in approximately the last five years. Obviously, the market can fluctuate, and the need for more accurate data meant that we had to target a smaller pool. In total, we sent out 82 individual anonymous invitations to those meeting our selection criteria, and we received 38 responses for a total response rate of 46%. Of the 38 responses we received, the distribution of time since the completion of fellowship was fairly uniform with a slight bias for those with greater than three years of post-fellowship experience. The respondents also held a variety of positions with the three most common responses being positions at academic hospitals, hospital laboratories, and reference laboratories. Anecdotally, I would say that this represents the typical mix of first positions most of our peers have. When it comes to the number of applications sent out, I felt that I was in good company. I, like the vast majority of respondents, applied for more than two positions. Of the 37 responses to the question, only five applied for two or less positions. When I was personally looking for a job, I wasn't sure of what kind of position would be ideal for me, so I applied for a lot of them. And when you apply for a lot of jobs, you typically have to prepare for a number of on-site interviews, which brings me to the Cycle 360 fun fact for June. A few weeks ago, we sent out the Cycle 360 fun fact question. Based on a survey of Cycle members, How many on-site interviews do you think the typical cycle member has prior to accepting their first director level position? One, two, three, four, or five or greater interviews. The result of this fun fact survey question reveals that most of the respondents think that the typical number of on-site interviews is between two and three. Very few of the respondents expected the typical cycle member to only have one or four or more on-site interviews. And the answer to this fun fact question was... Incredibly similar to the results of the survey. When asked how many on-site interviews the survey respondents had, they indicated that they had between two and three on-site interviews. However, unlike the fun fact responses, in this sample of cycle members, many people had four or more interviews. I know that the thought of multiple interviews is both tiring and terrifying, but I think that it can offer you a better sense of what kind of job you ultimately want to have. 
Interviewing is also not necessarily a natural skill, and you do need to practice it. So if you do interview in multiple places, you will likely find that the interviews do get easier. However, it may also be prudent to hone up the interview skills beforehand, and you can do just that at one of the symposia at the AACC annual meeting this year, developed in conjunction with Cycle, Getting Started and Changing Jobs, a practical guide to transitioning in the real world. Remember to also check out Kaylin Olson's podcast that will highlight this and many other sessions of interest to Cycle members. Hopefully, using those tips and tricks that you'll learn this year at the AACC, you'll be able to translate all those interviews into job offers. Of those responding to the survey, you'll note that many had multiple job offers to choose from. It would appear from this data that the job market is still looking good for trainees in clinical chemistry. Now, as for the question I know all of you want answered, what kind of salary can you, as a new hire, expect with your training? This is an important question. There is no doubt about it. And it's hard to know what to expect when the field is so small like ours. And without further delay, the answer is... Well, I'm not going to tell you. Here's the range of salaries that were included in the survey. And unfortunately for you, the listener, I am not going to reveal the breakdown of salaries here in this podcast. If you want that level of detail, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to navigate to the Cycle homepage. At the Cycle homepage, you'll find the link to the employment survey. And once there, you can see what the responses to the salary range question were, as well as other great stuff, such as your peers' responses to questions such as the expectation for being on call, whether they received assistance with relocation expenses, and if they get bonus pay on top of their salary. If you don't know where the Cycle homepage is, I've left a link for you in the accompanying slide. And finally, I hope that all of you will be able to attend the AACC annual meeting this year. I'll see you all in Chicago. Hi, and welcome to another Cycle360 podcast interview. So if you've received your first letter of job offer, and you're excited about the position and the business terms, but you're not sure what the legal terms in the contract mean. With me today to talk about contract negotiation is Mr. John Patrick, attorney at Riminger Attorneys at Law, who bring 20 years of experience in contract negotiation. Hi, John, and thank you for joining us today. Hi, Joe. I'm glad to help. Great. Can you please begin by explaining to us what contract negotiation is? and why it is important for all of us to go through it as part of our job search. Well, at a, at a minimum, you would want to understand the terms of your contract. Uh, contracts are typically broken into four parts. What is the employee's rights and obligations? And what are the employer's rights and obligations? So at a minimum, you'd like to understand what the rules are of your employment. Um, beyond that minimum, you may want to be able to revise and negotiate different terms to protect or advance your interest. So what I do is I review contracts, and I've been doing this, as I said, for 20 years. You know, half the time I'm doing this for employers, so I know what the employer's risks and concerns are. And the other half of the time I'm doing it for employees, where I'm negotiating on their behalf. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to review the contract and point out ambiguous terms, things that could be interpreted many ways, and try to get that in, in, revised to my client's benefit, if possible, or at least neutral. And I'm going to point out provisions that are not customary um, and try to point out how we can revise those to make them more customary. Um, part of the process is uh, I will review the contract and then report my findings to, to my client. Um, and then I encourage my client to then take back their concerns based upon my findings. And I may have 10 things that I've mentioned are issues, and they may only be concerned about four of those. I encourage them usually to take back these four points and talk with their employer about those because this is a great testing ground to see, do I really want to be employed here? Do they listen to me? Do they respect me? Do they, uh, do they respond to my questions? Um, and, and so that's a great testing ground to figure out, is this where I want to be working? Sometimes, though, my clients either feel uncomfortable about that or one or two issues they like me to stay involved. So I will oftentimes revise a contract or pick up the phone and call the employer or their counsel and talk about what, import, what, what points are important to my client. 
So as a follow-up to that, what legal terms in the contract should we particularly watch out for and be prepared to negotiate? So could you give us some examples? Sure. As I said, most contracts are broken into those four parts. What are the employee's rights and obligations, and what are the employer's rights and obligations? Um, but there's five uh, important areas of any contract, and one, the first one would be the term of employment. How long is this contract apply for? When someone's relocating to a different geographical area, I typically am, am urging them to get some job security, to do some personal planning, family planning. Are you putting the kids in school? Are you signing a 12-month lease? Are you buying a home? Well, if you're doing these types of things, we want some stability, some security. I don't want to take a job and move to New Mexico and then find out that they can let me go with 30 days notice, and now I've got to find another job. So I'd like to, to have an, a, so the first area of importance to me is the term of employment, and I'm usually recommending that we get a fixed term of one or two years where the employer cannot terminate employment unless something bad happens, which is a for-cause termination, as opposed to a termination without cause. Now, there's some... That you're, some, you're sacrificing some flexibility there, and that if you're saying, employer, you can't terminate me for two years unless I do something bad, you've got to be willing to accept the, the, the flip side of that, and that you can't terminate for any reason unless they do something bad. So that's usually the first part, part is, hey, we need to do some personal planning, family planning, and I need some stability. Can I have a guaranteed one, two, or three-year term where you can only get rid of me if I do something bad? Um, and that's the way most contracts are broken into is an initial term and then a renewal terms. The second most important is, is tail insurance. Tail insurance is, is malpractice insurance, professional liability insurance that covers claims that arise after termination of employment. So you worked for an employer through 2013, you took a new job with an employer in 2014, and while we're sitting here in February of 2014, you get served with a lawsuit um, relating to work services you provided with your employer last year. The insurance, the, the insurance that they had for you more than likely is not going to apply to that claim, so you're going to have to purchase tail insurance at the end of your termination. So the question always is, whose responsibility is that? Is that the physician's responsibility to pay for tail insurance, or is that the employer's uh, obligation and it's about 50 50 and it's not so bad that if it is the employee's obligation if that's the culture of that practice then more than likely without the company having that expense for for physicians who leave there's more money to go around to either be reinvested in the business or to be distributed as bonus or earnings or profits so it's not so bad that if the employee is but you want to prepare for that as I said if earlier in, the, in our discussion, at a minimum, you want to know what's in there. And if I get terminated from employment and I'm going to have a $40,000 premium to pay for tail insurance, I better start saving for that now. Another important area is the termination section. And most termination sections say uh, employer can terminate for cause if, you, if the employee does something wrong and without cause. And then usually the employee has the right to terminate for cause and without cause. So I want to review these and make sure that they're customary type of provisions. Oftentimes I'm trying to secure for my client the ability to have a notice and a cure period for any defaults. So if, if a provision in a contract says we can terminate you if you fail to satisfy any terms of this contract, I want to add to that section provided you give me notice that I was in default and give me 30 days to fix that default. So oftentimes we're just protecting you from being blindsided from things you weren't, you weren't aware of. Excellent. Another important area is the restrictive covenant section. Now this could take many different shapes. Uh, a restrictive covenant is something that says, I am restrained from doing something. Now normally this applies during employment in that your employer doesn't want you competing against them and, and referring work outside of their business. So there's going to be a, a provision that says, while I am employed here, I will be loyal to my employer. But then there's also provision customary to these contracts that says, after employment, I will be restrained from doing certain things. Now, ideally, I can get these limited to a non-solicitation, meaning that when employment terminates, I will not solicit your patients and I will not solicit any employees to leave your employment. And that's a reasonable expectation 
for your employer and that they're going to, to hire you, invest resources into you, they don't want when you terminate for you to hurt them by hurting their business. Another type of restrictive covenant is a non-compete or a covenant against competition, which is more broad than a non-solicitation. Uh, a, a covenant not to compete says, I agree that for a period of time, maybe one year, maybe two years, after employment, I will not compete with your business within a geographic area. Oftentimes these are described in terms of a radius from an office that you work at or from a hospital, but they can also be um, broken into cities or counties. You know, so a, a covenant not to compete can look like after employment terminates, you cannot compete for two years within Cuyahoga County uh, against us. So I, what I'm trying to do when I get these provisions is reduce them to non-solicitation and not restrain competition. And, but if I'm stuck with a non I'm trying to work on limiting the time, limiting the geography they apply to, and then getting some exceptions. And two common exceptions I try to revise into a, a covenant not to compete are, employer, if you do something wrong to me and I have to quit employment, and I wouldn't be quitting if you didn't default under this contract, I should be saddled with this additional burden of not being able to, to seek employment within this area. And also, employer, if you let me go for no reason, I shouldn't have this added burden. So, so that's a, always a very important section is those restrictive covenants. I'm sorry, a final one to, to, to be concerned about is, as I said, the important parts of the contract are rights and obligations. So you can read a 20-page, a 30-page contract and be very comfortable with the stated obligations in that contract. We always want to be concerned about rules and obligations that are, be, that are being incorporated by reference. And uh, almost every contract I've ever reviewed has these in that that says, in addition to the obligations in this contract, you're responsible for complying with our bylaws and our rules and regulations and the hospital's bylaws. And so these rules and regulations, which are typically not problematic, we want to see. We want you to be able to see these and make sure that you're not going to have any problems complying with those. Great. So be sure to ask for them is what you're asking. Yes. Whenever we see these rules being incorporated by reference, we want you to request that you see those. Excellent. So, but what if the employer is unwilling to negotiate the language of the contract? Because from my personal experience, this is especially true with a large corporation that offers standardized contracts. Yes, I, I do run into that every now and then. And I, I have em, employers who are clients of mine that have that same practice where we have a standard form and we're not willing to negotiate. Oftentimes, when they've reached that position where they have a standard form, it's a fair contract. It's right down the middle. It doesn't unduly favor employer or employee. So oftentimes, these contracts are standardized because they've been through the test. They are good contracts. Um, at a minimum, though, as I said earlier, you want to understand the risks involved in a standard contract that, that they aren't willing to, to revise for your protection. So if you are obligated to have tail insurance coverage and they're not willing to change that or exclude out certain events, you want to be able to prepare for that. So if you are let go, you've had some savings where you can afford to pay for that premium. Um, so even if they're not willing to negotiate, at a minimum, you want to understand what the risks are. In that instance, what I encourage my clients to do is get more comfortable with this employer then. You want to meet with physicians who are, who are, are similarly situated to you or who are in the same position of you and find out what the culture is at this place and what is employee morale and is this a good employer, is this a good fit. Oftentimes you're also using this as a business decision if you're looking at multiple employers and one employer is willing to work with you and revise their contract uh, to address your concerns, but the other one is not. Um, so you'd use that as a factor in deciding which employer to seek. Excellent. So do you have any additional advice to current job seekers? Yes. Most contracts are broken into business terms and legal terms. And, and I'm very comfortable advising all my clients on what the legal terms of a contract should be. Um, what, what happens before contracts get to me is that there's an agreement on business terms. Business terms meaning the compensation, you're, what you're going to get, and maybe a sign-on bonus or a relocation moving expense reimbursement. Um, these are business terms that should be discussed at the beginning or during this process, the, their interview process. 
employers are reluctant to revisit those once the offer letter has been signed because they've felt that these issues have already been addressed. So you want to make sure that you've asked all the questions that you can about these business terms during that stage of this process rather than when an, rather than an attorney is involved because you don't want that attorney asking questions about the business terms. As I said, most employers think we've already settled those. And another issue is we've talked about tail, uh, tail insurance and, and professional liability insurance. And, and you can get comfortable with that, that I have insurance that's going to cover if anyone says I failed to meet a standard of care. Well, now that you've signed a contract, you've got contract liability. That if someone says you've breached this contract, they can be filing a lawsuit against you uh, for monetary damages. So once you've signed this contract, we should look at maybe doing some asset protection planning. And if you are signing a new contract and you're moving to Pennsylvania to start this, to, to start your employment and you're going to buy a house, should the house be in my name or should it be in my spouse's name? Or should I create an LLC that owns my house to protect it from professional liability claims and from contract claims if someone says I breached this? Or if I end up becoming a partner in, in my employer and one of the partners sues me, and that's professional liability. So we also want to focus on uh, doing asset protection planning for physicians. One last thing to, to recommend is don't be afraid to ask questions. Employers that I represent uh, are, are like an employee who has the wherewithal to be concerned about their individual practice and areas that concern them. So do not be afraid to negotiate um, and, and have that back and forth with these people. They're, the people who you're talking with are business people. They're used to negotiating contracts. Yes, maybe they started out as a physician similarly to where you are, but now they've ascended to doing operating in a business or administrative capacity. These aren't things that are foreign to them. So be very comfortable negotiating and asking for, for points that you think protect you. Perfect. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate you taking the time and uh, giving us information on what is contract negotiation and how to do it. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I'm glad to assist. This podcast section is the second installment in which we are going to give Cycle members some useful information about finding their second position. In order to do this, we have asked Dr. David Grenache to give us an insight into his experiences when changing from his first to second position. I would like to introduce Dr. David Grenache. Dr. Grenache, thank you for joining us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So would you like to tell us a little bit about um, your first and second positions? So my, uh, my first job after my uh, clinical chemistry training was at the University of North Carolina uh, School of Medicine at Chapel Hill. I was the associate director of the core lab and also an assistant professor of pathology and laboratory medicine. And it was a, a classic, uh, you know, academic medical center type uh, opportunity for a clinical chemist. Um, I was given responsibilities over a certain section of the laboratory and I worked uh, very closely with uh, two colleagues and mentors um, that uh, uh, taught me quite a bit and uh, helped me uh, cut my teeth uh, in the sort of what the what the role of a, of a, of a laboratory director was uh, in clinical uh, laboratory science. And then uh, after spending four years there, I was recruited to the University of Utah and uh, ARUP Laboratories, which is owned by the University of Utah. Um, uh, and in that role, uh, uh, I am the uh, A Medical Director at uh, ARUP uh, with uh, clinical responsibilities in our special chemistry laboratory. And I uh, also has a an academic appointment. At the in the uh, Department of Pathology uh, here at the School of Medicine. Wonderful, that's great. So, you mentioned that you did change your your job from um, from North Carolina to um, Utah. So, when you were beginning to think about a position change, what were some of the factors that you considered? Well, uh, quite honestly, I wasn't really thinking about changing jobs at the at, at the time that this opportunity at Utah came up. Uh, I was quite happy uh, with my uh, uh, career uh, progress at, in North Carolina, uh, but I got a call from um, a colleague, uh, 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 Dr. Bill Roberts, um, one day when I was at UNC, 
and he told me, asked me uh, if I was aware of this uh, position at AIRUP, and I was aware of it. I had had a few other friends who had um, come out here to interview, um, and I was, you know, very supportive of them, of course, uh, but I didn't have my eyes on leaving UNC, so I never thought about tossing my hat in the ring. But after Bill called me and invited me out to um, interview, uh, I thought about it for a few days before I gave him an answer. Uh, and then ultimately I decided I would at least come and check it out because, uh, you know, it was, it was no commitment just to come look at the job and see what the opportunity was here. Uh, and so after a few days of reflection, I called Bill back and said, yes, I, uh, I would like to accept your invitation to come out. And so I came out uh, to interview and met a whole bunch of uh, folks on, uh, and had a really great visit. That sounds great. <laughs> Um, so, obviously, after your visit to AREP Laboratories, you were interested in the in the position. Um, so, how did you approach your current employer, and um, with regards to you know letting them know about about the fact that you were interested in this new position? So, I I didn't actually approach uh, my uh, my department chairperson at UNC after that first visit to AREP. Um, I, uh, I was invited out as, uh, for a second uh, visit uh, to AIRUP, and I, and, and I came out here, uh, and that's when they made me a job offer. And at, after uh, some considerable reflection upon returning to North Carolina, uh, I accepted the position. And that's when I went to my, um, my chairperson uh, and my colleagues at uh, the University of North Carolina and told them that I, had, I, I was planning to leave UNC and come to the University of Utah. So yeah, that could definitely be somewhat of a difficult situation to manage. Um, is there something, is there anything you would do differently if you could, you know, with hindsight? So uh, one thing I wish I had done differently uh, would be to have gone to my colleagues and my department chairperson either uh, after accepting the invitation to come to Utah for the first time for that interview, or at least after I had come back from that first visit. And I wish I had gone to them just to share with them that I was uh, uh, asked to look at that, this uh, new opportunity, that I had been uh, quite impressed with what I saw, uh, and um, that I was thinking about um, accepting uh, a position there if it went that far. And the reason I would have done that was really to get their guidance and their counsel um, and not necessarily to leverage uh, uh, one position against the other. That wouldn't have been my intent. Um, uh, and and I, the reason I, I would have done it that way is because after I, the, the path I did take, you know, telling them that I was leaving after I had accepted the job here at Utah, um, when I did that, uh, I realized that uh, I think they were a little bit disappointed in how things unfolded, and um, they had some really sage advice for me, uh, uh, just about you know uh, changing jobs in general uh, that uh, I think uh, would have been helpful. And w when you change it, at least for me, when I was when I was in that situation, uh, con uh, changing a, a, a job. Um, I had a lot of questions that I didn't really feel like had answers for, and that I didn't, I couldn't identify anyone uh, in my sphere that I could go to to help me find answers to those questions. But subsequently, I realized that I did have people that could help me address those questions, uh, and those would have been the people that I should have gone to, my colleagues and my chairperson. Yeah. So I wish I had done that differently, and I've and I've always regretted that I didn't do it that way. Yeah, that's that's a great insight actually, and then <laughs> good advice for cycle members. <laughs> so something that's always kind of intrigued me is is how different it would be um, starting your second position as compared to starting your first position straight out of fellowship. So I was wondering if you could share your experience with us. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, I remember uh, really well uh, my first day uh, in my job at UNC. Um, I remember getting there and being shown my office and being introduced to lots of people 
And the first moment that I had some time alone, I thought to myself, what am I doing? What am I going to do? What, what do I do now? I don't know what to do. <laughs> um, and I think that's just, you know, normal anxiety. Uh, at, at, but fortunately, very fortunately, I was in an environment where I wasn't the only um, clinical chemist. And as I mentioned, I had two uh, associates, uh, uh, two uh, colleagues uh, that were terrific mentors for me. And uh, not only were they good mentors, but the whole the whole laboratory staff um, recognized that you know I was new and I probably needed some uh, some guidance. And and so uh, I was um, uh, I was in a good position to learn. And so that that first job is really where I I learned a whole. I learned a whole lot of stuff. I, I didn't necessarily, certainly I learned factual knowledge, you know, stuff that I, uh, I didn't learn as part of my education. But more importantly, uh, I learned a lot of more practical tools or practical skills. I learned a lot about um, uh, laboratory management and um, uh, how to work well with teams and groups of people. Because, you know, prior to that, if you think about it, uh, uh, many, uh, uh, probably my experience isn't unlike many others in that, uh, you know, you go through graduate school and sometimes, uh, at least it was in my case, it was a very sort of solo process. You know, I worked really on my own project uh, with guidance from my um, PI, uh, but I didn't, I was never really in a situation uh, in graduate school uh, uh, and even in my postdoc where I had to work with large groups of people. And, and then I did have to do that uh, in my first job at UNC and as you would in any sort of um, uh, clinical laboratory environment. So I learned a lot of management skills and people skills and um, uh, you know, how to give and take and compromise and uh, I, uh, uh, I really sort of cut my teeth on all that. So when I came to Utah for my second job, um, I felt much more confident in my ability to, to be a, a, a director of a laboratory. Uh, I kind of, I, I, I already had some ideas coming into uh, ARUP uh, that I wanted to, I already had some ideas of what I wanted to work on or, or influence change on or in, in, in the laboratories that I was responsible for. So I guess I came in with more confidence uh, and with more um, management and people skills than I did with my first job. Did the people um, in the new position treat you differently compared to when you started in your first position? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I really don't think so, uh, or at least it's not my impression that I was treated differently. Um, you know, because you come to a, you come to a new place and um, Many, many, many of the folks that you interact with, that to them, you're just the new person. Right. And like any new person in an organization, you know, there's a lot of things you don't know yet. You have yeah. to learn the organizational structure. Right. Uh, and so I was, you know, I was appropriately cared for in that regard. You know, people helping me find not only find my way around, but just learning the the culture of the organization. And I think that would have, have that would certainly have happened had I. I, uh, had I come to Utah right out of a training program, uh, regardless of, of your past experience, there's always a, 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 a new uh, a new organization that you have to uh, sort of learn how to navigate. Right, definitely. So, do you have any advice for cycle members who might be thinking about changing positions? Yeah, um, I, I think my advice would be to um, uh, to carefully consider why you are uh, want to leave uh, a current job if you're changing a current role um, if you're considering a career change uh, ask yourself why um, uh, that's an obvious question to ask you know why why do I want to change jobs um, are you changing because there's you're unsatisfied with your current job uh, or you know wh what is it that's motivating you to look for a new opportunity uh, and in some cases, like it was in mine, uh, I wasn't really looking for a new job. A new job found me. Um, but I, eventually you get to that point where you have to make a decision, well, I will either go or I will stay. Um, and uh, I think that if you're going to if you're going to consider a career change, um, uh, it probably should be m moving into a role 
in where you see future growth for yourself. You know, does your new job, does the new opportunity uh, give you, um, uh, uh, will it allow you to expand a skill set or engage in an activity that will allow you to grow professionally and personally in a way in which you can't see happening in your current role. I would avoid uh, looking for a new job uh, based solely on geography uh, unless that um, uh, sometimes there are family reasons to have to obviously relocate uh, uh, solely based on geography. Uh, but I think that um, uh, that the primary motivator or a reason to consider um, switching opportunities uh, would be to uh, be because you've identified a path forward that expands your knowledge or skills or uh, you see growth or leadership potential that you <clears throat> can't identify or you can't see in your current uh, 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 your, your current career uh, and and if that's the reason that you're considering a change uh, and you really don't want to change, you might want to consider uh, identi you know, working with um, the people that you have to report to in your current role to explain to them, you know, here's, here's what I'm looking for, and is there an opportunity within the current job you have, if it's something that you like, and you're in a place that you really enjoy, um, but you don't feel you're growing in the way that you need to, then reach out to the leaders in your organization that can guide you, and perhaps you can create those opportunities for yourself. Um, what were you are now? That's great advice. Thank you so much, sure. Dave, David. I'd like to thank you for participating in this uh, podcast with us and for sharing your insight with Cycle members. You're welcome. Thanks for the invite. Whether you attend for the scientific sessions, connections with colleagues, the products at the expo, or all of these reasons, the AACC annual meeting is the must-attend conference for clinical laboratorians. In this section of the podcast, I will highlight a selection of sessions and events that may be of interest for cycle members at the 2014 AACC annual meeting. As you choose your sessions and events, remember that there are many great options that are free of charge with your meeting registration. Even cycle members with a tight budget can enjoy scientific sessions like the plenarium poster sessions and social events like the ABCC cycle reception on Monday evening. Each year, many sessions address hot topics in laboratory medicine, and this year is no exception. There are many sessions on topics related to advances in technologies, such as molecular diagnostics for diagnosis of disease and personalized treatments, new mobile technologies, and the power of data mining. There is also continued focus on ways to improve quality, along with new focuses in point-of-care testing and toxicology. Cycle members may also want to attend sessions on improving leadership and management skills, which are invaluable for any laboratory professional as they build their career. As usual, there is great involvement by Cycle members in hosting brown bag interactive small group sessions. Brown bag sessions are the perfect way to meet new colleagues and have active discussions on important laboratory topics. The sessions listed are just a fraction of the many available for breakfast and lunchtime Monday through Wednesday, each at an affordable cost of $25. With this year's celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Society for Young Clinical Laboratorians program, the Cycle Workshop and Mixer is sure to be the place to be. Arrive in Chicago early to gain insights from several experienced laboratory medicine colleagues on how you can improve your value as a laboratory director while improving the overall quality of your laboratory testing at your institution. After you learn at the workshop, you can kick back and enjoy the Cycle Mixer, where we will toast to Cycle's 10th anniversary and the start of another fun week at the AACC annual meeting. To find more detailed information on all sessions and events, including those reviewed in this podcast, and to register for the 2014 AACC annual meeting, navigate to the AACC website. We look forward to seeing you in Chicago.